John Grom, and welcome to our 215th Right and Left Discussion Forum. We hold our televised discussions twice monthly to demonstrate the value of civil, productive, open-minded political dialogue. Today, our panel will discuss the question, is the ultimate purpose of higher education employment or human flourishing? Today's uh, discussion begins with Dr. Ronald Chamberlain, retired senior research chemist, and Tom Finley, retired VP of Human Resource Development at Rubbermaid Incorporated, and Patty Haskins, former member of the Wadsworth City Council and faculty of Wadsworth High School. Ron, the ultimate purpose of higher education uh, is uh, employment or human flourishing, or to put it another way, the purpose of education is not to earn, earn your daily bread, but to make each mouthful taste sweeter. What are your thoughts? John, I've done no really research on this other than my own experience, which I think is quite relevant here. Uh, I knew in high school days that I wanted to be a chemist. And as soon as I hit ninth grade general science, I realized this this is going to be for me and chemistry class, some of that. So I've so I, I worked hard to keep my grades up, wound up being valedictorian in my high school, pretty much all A's. Uh, I could have gone to the state university, Penn State. There was a, a branch campus just a few miles from my house, but I opted instead for a liberal arts college. I got a good scholarship money there called Juniata College in a little town of Huntington, Pennsylvania, in the center of the state. And... Uh, my eyes were open at that point. Now, I had discovered some of the arts. Uh, during high school, I discovered uh, I discovered classical music, for example, which is a little, quite a bit different from the country western that I'd grown up with and the, the pop music and the, and the, uh, the hit parade uh, standards. So uh, when I got to Juniata, this was a whole different atmosphere. The, the purpose there of this liberal arts school, although it had a very – well-respected chemistry and biology departments that put out a lot of pre-med students and that sort of thing. You didn't actually choose a major until your junior year in any official way, although chemists had to start early <clears throat> with chemistry and physics and all, and all that. But you're required as freshmen to start taking a series of introductory courses. There was one on the arts, there was a, it was a it was a church school, so there was a biblical history course, uh, there was elementary psychology, uh, there was economics and all that sort of thing. And uh, you had then the opportunity to take and were encouraged to take uh, elective courses outside your major. I took uh, I took uh, ancient civilization, for example, at one point and uh, enjoyed my languages. I took a year and a half of German and a, a semester of French and uh, just enjoyed that sort of thing. I didn't get much involved in the arts. I didn't do any singing in, in, uh, in college or anything of the sort, but... But, but it gave me a background, I think, in just more than training, the rather rigorous uh, that I got is, as a chemist so that I could go on to graduate school and, and get advanced degrees. Uh, I had that. But at the same time, I was broadened in my outlook on life. Uh, seniors took a required uh, philosophy and ethics course, for example, uh, taught by a, by actually by the dean of the college, but <laughs> very relevant. But uh, you know, so I learned about Immanuel Kant and Thomas Hobbes and all those folks, <clears throat> and uh, and our roommate in grad school for a while was a philosophy major, so we had good times. But the idea of enrichment of your daily life and enrichment of your outlook on life was came to me to be very very important. And it seemed to me that uh, in, t in terms of higher education, I got my, my training, I got my job training, but I also got a little deeper depth on where this fits in the world. And I think that should be the goal of higher education, uh, not just as a trade school, though there's a, certainly a place for that, not as a trade school, not to just to train you for your, for your, uh, <clears throat> for your future career, which may change. Uh, and uh, but to give you a broader outlook, I had I had at least one friend, uh, two friends really. One who uh, in her in her uh, junior year to choose her major, she chose pre med. She'd been a music major, you know. She played all sorts of instruments, and sang, and all that stuff. She became a, became an MD and had a successful career as a pediatrician. Another fellow came back after a year or two out of high school. He was business major, 
and uh, was in the insurance business and he was living in Philadelphia with a bunch of classmates who were pre-meds, who were med students, um, got interested in that, came back to Junian, took some uh, took some science courses and entered med school. So it gives you a broader outlook, I think. Uh, and I think that that sh really should be the goal of higher education, both to, to make that daily bread sweeter but to, and to earn your daily bread. So that's that's my experience. And uh, I have found all my life that to be important. I've, as you know, I've been involved in all kinds of things. I've I've done music. I've done. Uh, I now do the woodworking, which is which I consider in some cases it gets a little bit toward the, away from craft into the art art thing. Some of my pieces I'm quite fond of, quite proud of. Uh, mm -hmm. I've done photography. I've done just all sorts of things of, of that nature. So mm -hmm. that's given me, I think, a broader outlook on life in, in uh, philosophy, politics, and so on, that I would not have gotten had I just gone to Penn State and been a chemistry major for all four years and so on. So uh, no research, but that's my experience. So that's- yeah, Well, I have to, I, I have to uh, acknowledge your explanation. I can't imagine a better way to describe this topic than what you just did. Thank you, John. Perfect. Tom, what are your thoughts? Uh, they're a little bit different, but I'm going back to the conversation I just heard, and it, and it makes me even more uh, intense about a whole new look at this business of education in our country. So when I, I sat back and said, if I had to name the number one resource, the number one resource that we must promote and, and make happen, it's our intellectual resources. They make everything else happen in the country, and especially our country, which is driven by competition, freedoms, et cetera, et cetera. So all the, uh, the discussion, I'll put it politely, about uh, forgiving the, the uh, debt of uh, loans and student loans and so forth, well, why not? That's that's the resource that's so important to this country. And we should turn it into uh, a much more competitive base among those resource uh, that provide it. Uh, for instance, now we divide school districts and that's where you get your schooling. And if you don't like it there, it doesn't make any difference. That's where you get your schooling, unless you send them to a private school. Uh, so I'm looking at it from a whole different standpoint, saying it's the most vital place we can spend our monies and resources and thoughts because they produce our future, our scientists, our astronauts, our laborers, and the list goes on. So that's where I'm coming from, from uh, this whole business of, it, it, it's not so, uh, flowery or anything else it's it's a basic necessity of the country so i, I take it out of the hands of the educators and you know, i was an educator for 20 years we were very narrow focused people on the delivery of education uh i don't know as it's done much changing since but it ought to um, well, uh, Patty, Patty, you spent more than 20 years as an educator. Yeah. Where are you, what are your thoughts? One, one last thing. Oh. And I was, it was going to be on Patty, and that would have been a great handoff. But <laughs> uh, I started teaching in Barberton, and Barberton, of all communities, of course, did provide for intellectually talented people and established gifted classrooms, Patty being from that environment and it allowed those children and those teachers to, to present and go places and they wouldn't have gone in, in the other classrooms that was an insightful there ought to be more of it so patty you were in special class I, I wanted to say special ed but that has a different connotation to it. <laughs> well unfortunately yes but she was it was a special ed it oh. was, the program was called Major Work, and it was uh, replaced and after about, oh, I think, maybe 10 years that it stayed in, in effect. 
Uh, Tom was, of course, one of my best teachers that I had. He was my fifth grade teacher in the program. And it was the second year we started it when I was in fourth grade. And we did have so many extra opportunities, as Tom mentioned. Uh, We were taught a foreign language, or at least the beginnings of that. We got to go on special field trips uh, that the other kids in the school weren't uh, able to, but it was because of the um, educational value that would be brought to the student. And it was a a rather rigorous uh, selection process. Uh, We had quite a few students that that, uh, went into the program, and we were uh, separated in our classes um, as we had a, you know, a major, the major work class stayed together. So you became very close to those students all the way through ninth grade. When we got to the high school, unfortunately, they weren't prepared for that type of setup. And unfortunately, the only major work classes class that existed was math, which was good for me because that was my strong suit. So I was, uh, really blessed to have excellent teachers and a a very good education uh, before I attended college. Um, When I I did get to college, though, um, I I found that quite interesting. I I agree with everything that that Tom and and Ron have stated. I've I've always felt that uh, college is not just to find a job. Yes, if you're going to be a doctor, there are courses that you have to take in college to become that doctor. If you're going to be a teacher, there are courses that you have to take to become that teacher. But I always felt that the overall purpose of college was to make us better educated people and to understand the world that we live in. I've always felt that You know, the teachers, even like the kindergarten teacher needs to be a well-educated person to teach the, you know, the children. They don't need to know just the ABCs. They need to know more than that. I think uh, a well-rounded education, and like Ron, I actually started in liberal arts and did that for two years before I decided to go into education. But uh, I think that that liberal arts education opens your eyes to so many different fields and areas in the world that you may not have even known that you had an interest in. Um, I mean, I found I had a passion for history. And even though I was a math teacher, I loved history. I have more hours in history courses than I do in, um, than I actually do in mathematics. But I I think that makes us a, a better and a better educated populace and citizens. I mean, we want citizens that are voting to do so from a educated point of view, that they researched subjects, that they know some of the history behind uh, our politics and know what's going on in this country and what mistakes to avoid and what better way to provide for that educated populace and educated electorate than to provide a good college education. Now, at the same time, I've also said on many occasions that I'm not sure that college is for everybody. Uh, Not everyone can stand or handle the rigors of that type of education program. And I've never felt that colleges should have to dummy down material to accommodate every student that wants to go to that particular school. Um, You know, unfortunately, too many colleges right now are offering remedial math courses, remedial English courses, because students are going to college, which very honestly, they weren't prepared for, or perhaps are not capable of handling. And then for the college to have to teach remedial courses is, I think, a waste of their resources. And it's certainly the waste of the resources of that student who's paying you know, as Tom mentioned, thousands and thousands of dollars to go to that school and then end up dropping out after a year because they really shouldn't have been there. You know, these are the people that should have been perhaps in a trade school of some type. I mean, is I guess 
is it necessary that our plumber understand history or be able to speak German or understand philosophy? Probably not, but yep, that is a necessary service that we have. Um, so I, I'm kind of mixed on it. I, I, I think the purpose of that college is to educate us, but I think that there are times and places where perhaps the college is not the best fit for an individual, that they need to be doing something else and should train for that instead. And we're seeing, you know, a decline in the trade schools. I, 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 my, my father, for example, um, brilliant man, very, very bright man, never went to college. I uh, fought in World War II and it, before he was in World War II, he was uh, a machinist and he had gone to a, a trade school for that. He had to take the appropriate math courses at Akron University in conjunction with that trade school. And uh, that just simply wasn't for him. Uh, but, and, but there were those trade schools available and mm -hmm. the apprenticeship programs. We don't see those types of things as often anymore. Even, you know, if you look at the vocational programs that are now being offered at the high school, when I first started teaching, the vocational programs were actually set by the state for students that were not going to college. And when the programs were evaluated, which determined how much money the, the district got for those programs, they were actually took a ding if any of the students in their program didn't immediately after high school go into that trade, but rather went to college. Now they're steering towards vocational programs that put the student in college for a technical program they have to continue. So it's not taking kids out of high school and putting them right into, into a job, unless it's, for example, the carpentry program or the automotives program. Many of them are tech-based and are actually prepping kids for high school program for college programs mm -hmm. you know patty uh you, the example and what you just shared uh is right on target with education as a and, and looking at our population as the most important resource we have an educated population it isn't recognized by educators who ought to be leading the way in that but and it, it is what it is uh, if I could just use this example, John Rubbermaid, uh, Tom Ward uh, gave me, uh, because Stan Galt had the vision, uh, uh, not an open pocketbook, but I spent money putting training and development uh, together at Rubbermaid. Uh, I think the uh, record of Stan Galt, he's brilliant in terms of of uh, being a businessman and all that, but Stan insisted upon that happening, that being educating. And it's not surprising that a Rubbermaid went from a $250 million to a $2 billion company during his 20 years there. And I think the primary reason is we educated everybody. Wherever we had an opportunity, we put trade programs in place. We educated the, the laborer on the front line and the list goes on. And it was the reason for, a primary reason for Rubbermaid's success. So why wouldn't it be, we'll follow that, it would be and will be a primary reason for our success as a nation to have the scientists, to have the laborers who can make things that the scientists figure out how to and the list goes on. <clears throat> you know, and, and in the past, many you know, companies would pay for its, their employees to go on to college. They would hire them in, put them in some type of program, and then send them to college to get the yes. education. That's not happening now. Right. Very, very seldom. My, my son was very fortunate. He works for the Federal Reserve, had his uh, uh, bachelor's in finance from John Carroll, but when he started working for the Federal Reserve, they gave him uh, money to in order to uh, get his MBA. And that was very helpful for him. 
Uh, I'm not, I don't think it paid for everything, but it sure as heck helped. But the Federal Reserve valued their employees having advanced degrees and having as much education as possible um, because it makes for a better workforce. Well, uh, listening to uh, 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 Ron's uh, description of his college days uh, makes me envious. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I, I can't think of a, 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 you know, a, a better educational background to prepare somebody for a successful life. The um, thing that I'm concerned about right now, well, I haven't been in a college classroom in over 50 years, so I don't know what's going on. Right. I know what I hear. And it, uh, what I hear is that a lot of universities are being used as propaganda uh, sources to um, uh, promote one political view over others. And I'm wondering how that fits. Uh, if, uh, you know, is it, is it beneficial or should we be doing something to stop it? We, we, again, we don't have that. We don't see this uh, as a country. It's uh, education has never been a political football. No one is taking the lead role in seeing how important this is. Colleges are terrific examples of how not to. Uh, personal, personal. I I quit, went back, spent two years working on my doctorate. It was the most wasted thing I ever did. And I did one of the most stupidest things I ever did. It's, I'm now to the dissertation. I'm now sitting in front of my committee. And they're asking me these questions. They were inane. I took it for about 20 minutes. And I said, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. This, and I said this, I can remember it. Hell, I could have done this and answered these kind of questions before I ever started this program. And I walked out of my doctorate. Hmm. Yeah, uh, you're right. That was stupid. Tom. Stupid as can be. <laughs> but I had had it. I, I, it just was a glaring example of... After all know, that time, couldn't you have sucked it up for another five minutes? And well, got... I've answered myself that, or asked that question yeah, well. myself many, many times. <laughs> I told you it was the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> However, not necessarily. No, very good. About if you put in the work, it was it was probably not very smart to walk away from it. But <laughs> well, I had a, I had a, a colleague in, in grad school who uh, never finished his degree, and uh, well, I, I know two folks really, and another folk in a guy at, at PPG who had had never finished his doctorate and eventually it, it caught up with him and he had to take the pay cut and, you know, you know, a slight loss of position and all that. But at, at the time he had, he was an accomplished individual, so he didn't really lose out that much. Uh, my grad school colleague went back to a place where he had been working off and on since his high school days, Phillips, Phillips Petroleum Company in Oklahoma, which was his home and uh, uh, had a consulting career. So he, he parlayed his knowledge and so forth into that, although he never he never finished the degree. Uh, so it does happen. But again, that's more of an example of, of a trade school training than, than anything else, I think, uh, well, in, in his case. He wasn't a, he wasn't a well-rounded individual particularly, uh, my grad school colleague. Yeah. Nice well, I think there are times that my $8 stopwatch uh, is not working. Uh, particularly well, but I think our time is up and we'll uh, see you all in uh, two weeks, either in the studio or on Zoom. Three weeks? Three weeks. I don't know. Okay, three weeks? Three weeks. Yeah. Three weeks. Okay, we'll... By the way, right, that, that's in there's, cement. There's the rest of the story to walking away from that. But uh, well, I'll wait a minute. In another, I'll share it another time. Oh, well, you can share it right after we get signed off here. You, you still have two minutes. You still have two minutes if you want to take it. Well, it won't take, it won't take very long. Well, uh, go ahead. Have you walked out of there? Uh, I got a phone call from a very good friend who was uh, head of resources for the division at Worcester, Jack Gordon, 
And uh, Jack says, Tom, why don't you go on down and see me? I, I've got a position here for you if, you want, if you're interested in it. I went down to see Jack. I was hired. And I, I stayed in that position all of a year and it was promoted to corporate where I had the power and the resources to put in an educational program for Rubbermaid. That's the rest of the story. And you hired me and the rest is history. <laughs> it's one of the best recruiters. What did we have to have? Well, this guy followed the lead of define what you need for a job and then go looking for it. And uh, yeah, it was simple, but not easy. And it worked. He, he hired a tremendous staffing of people. A uh, hundred executives in 10 years. There you was. go. Yeah. Anyway, it's a success story, and I think that, that uh, of course, there ought to be more of it. But I do have a passion saying somebody somehow will wake up and find and say, educated people are our greatest resource. Mm. Great. Good conclusion. Mm. watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.